This message offered on Sunday, July 26, 2015, was the first in a series of five offered under the theme of I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. This first week, the sermon is entitled Jesus Took the Loaves. The gospel passage is from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down about five thousand in all, And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. When they rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. And he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Beloved in Christ, today we witness Jesus pour out his love for us in the place of abundant bread. Feeding thousands of people is his gift. All this points us to the place of the sacrament of Holy Communion, his body and blood, and the presence of Jesus with us. Our theme then today is that which we pray. Jesus took the loaves. We begin with that. Let us pray. As we break now the bread of your sacrifice, we give thanks as hungry ones gathered round. May we all eat and be satisfied in your presence, O Christ, knowing that the loaves will abound. John chapter 6 will be our gospel passage for the next five weeks. The key verse in chapter 6 is one of the great I am statements of Jesus in the gospel of John. Jesus tells us so much about himself in these seven I am's. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. 
I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. All these describe Jesus. And the words I am, well, they point back to the moment when Moses messed with God at the burning bush. God was sending Moses into a deadly mission to go back to Egypt to free the people. So in a stall tactic, Moses dared to ask a daring question. Something like, um, so uh, when they asked me who sent me, what should I say? Uh, so uh, who are you? In cryptic, boundary-setting ways, God said to Moses, that which has become, become unspeakable in Judaism, Yahweh. In other words, I am who I am. When Jesus says, I am, those who believe in him come to realize who he is. He is God. The entire sixth chapter of John then develops around a central theme of who Jesus is in an important verse, verse 35, I am the bread of life. So simple, yet absolutely necessary is this idea about bread or daily nourishment. You and I need it every day to survive. In the days of Jesus, earning daily bread for one's family and self was, for all too many, an ongoing challenge. Chapter 6, then, begins with one of the seven signs in the Gospel of John. Signs are what others would call miracles, but they point into what God is doing and what God intends for us. They include these seven things, these signs. Turning water into wine in Cana of Galilee at a wedding, healing an official son in Capernaum, healing an invalid at the pool of Bethsaida in Jerusalem, walking on the water of the Sea of Galilee and feeding the 5,000 near the Sea of Galilee, those two for in our chapter for today, and then healing a man born blind, and finally raising the dead in Lazarus at, at Bethany. The sign, our focus for today, and really for the weeks ahead, is the gift of bread. I am the bread of life, feeding the thousands. The people seem willing to follow Jesus almost anywhere, and in that they find themselves without bread, so they think. Jesus cares for them and plans to provide. He asks questions. Uh, often he asks questions in the Gospel of John, knowing full well the answer. He said, uh, well, so where can we get enough bread for all these people? And Philip, being very realistic actually in his answer, said, well, it would take a half a year's work to pay for a large feast like this. Uh, then it happens. A boy is brought forward with five barley loaves. Please remember that barley is not a great flour for bread. The fish, I would suspect, are dried up and stale. But then it happens. Bounty comes when none is expected. Thousands feed from a lunch hardly big enough for a small boy. That's provision. That's daily bread. That is the gift of Jesus in our midst. Let's watch and listen to this part of the story one more time. In the vehicle of the Gospel of John, the movie, we're going to begin today at verse 5 and end at verse 15. Please watch The Feeding of the 5,000. Yeah, yeah. The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. Where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. For everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish. But they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down. There was a lot of grass there, so all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men.
Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God. distributed to the people who were sitting there. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces left over. Let us not waste a bit. So they gathered them all and filled twelve baskets with the pieces left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people there said, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force, so he went off again to the hills by himself. There are so many important themes in this story. Themes like the abundance of God, the compassion of Jesus, these persistent following crowds, the disciples and how they understand Jesus. Of course, it all points toward, some would say, the gift of the sacrament of Holy Communion. We may return to those themes in later sermons, but today I'd like us to spend just a few moments thinking about the crowd and the confusion that came to them after they were fed. After they're fed, they try to make Jesus their power broker. That's right, their ruler. And he walks away. This is not the good news of which he speaks. They're confused about what really makes up the scope of the good news. Let's face it, we often are the same in the modern church of this day. The good news of the gospel is hard to share, and yes, even harder to understand. You know, news is always about telling the truth, right? That's what real news is about. And these days, have you noticed that it seems to be harder and harder for us to hear the real truth? The truth about this gospel is then it must first be honest news before it can be good news. We too can be confused. Frederick Buchner, in his book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale, describes why this truth-telling can be so hard. He writes this, Before the Gospel is good news, it's just news. What does he mean? Well, he, he goes on to explain that we must remember that there is no escape when we are confronted with who we really are, when we are forced to look honestly at ourselves with no illusions, excuses, or hiding places. That's news. That's the truth. But this is the gospel, the telling of the truth. As Buchner also writes, such truth is bad news before it's good news. It's the news that, yes, we are sinners. Dare I use that old-fashioned word? That's the tragedy. You see, the news is that we are sinners. We have fallen short. But the good news is, is that we're loved anyway. God cherishes you anyway. You are forgiven anyway. That's the good news. So we come here to this place to be who we are. And we don't need to wear a mask to hide. That's one of the gifts, I think, of Lutheran theology. We don't need to wear a mask to pretend that we're someone else. Here we are in a place of forgiven sinners who feed at a table of bounty every week. That is the ongoing gift of the great I Am, the bread of life. 
So today I want to close with a clip entitled The Mask. It reminds us about how it is in this place that we come with all honesty before God and one another, knowing the gifts of God. Please watch this clip entitled Masks. Here's a funny thing about people. We all like to look good, to make a good impression, to show everyone else we have it all together. Even though none of us do, the only way to pull this off is to put something else on. And that something is called a mask. A mask can help you get a job. I have over 12 years of consumer electronics experience playing video games in my parents' basement. It can make you look smarter. Organizational energies to maximize corporation synergy. I have no idea what I'm saying. And more dateable. I can't believe you're single. And I can't believe it's you're 25. I'm not single. I'm not 25. We even use them to protect the feelings of the people we love. That was a beautiful song, sweetie. I'm pretty sure you're tone deaf. I think I'm just going to walk to school today. I'm kind of embarrassed to be seen with you. He sounds like a great guy. What are you thinking? We all wear masks from time to time, but the craziest place we put them on is in church. Hello, brother. Amen. Greetings to you on this day that the Lord has made. Something about it makes us want to look our best. I'm fine. Sound our best. He hath blessedeth me so verily. And make like everything is perfect. Things are great. But behind every perfect mask is a perfectly messed up life. People with hearts that are empty, confused, addicted, hopeless, helpless, and hurting. People who think But here's the thing. This is exactly the kind of life where God shows up. Messes are his specialty. The one thing God can't work with is a mask. Nobody's perfect. But grace is available. We believe God doesn't love us if or because. He loves us anyway. We all like to look good to others. We like to make a good impression. But when it comes to God, the best impression you can make is to just be you. I'll try to take off my masks if you'll promise to do the same as we gather here in this place for who we are, forgiven, grace-filled people of God, given the gifts of bread, and the one who is and says, I am the bread of life, Jesus, who took the loaves. Amen.